Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to CDFI Success, Maximizing Potential for Women Business Owners. Super excited for this session in celebration of Women's History Month. My name is Michelle Eisenberg, and of course, I'm a program assistant at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. For those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit that's building a better path for entrepreneurs worldwide by improving inclusion, access, and knowledge in entrepreneurship. So as you will see in the chat in a moment, the NASDAQ Center provides programs, resources, and exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So definitely make sure to check out those links and resources in the chat. And then just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First, let us know where you are dialing in from in the chat. We always love to connect. And second, we are going to open up for live Q&A at the end of the event. So please make sure to submit your questions for us in that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. And we will try our best to get to all of them. And of course, none of what we do could be possible at the center without all of the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, BMO, Airbnb, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Microsoft Entrepreneurship for Positive Impact, BPM, and HubSpot for Startups. We are humbled by their contributions and hope you are grateful too. And so before we get started, we like to launch... Just a couple polls to step back, see how everyone in the room is doing today. This first one's going to ask, how are you feeling? Fearful, anxious, surviving, or optimistic? And we'll give this just a couple moments here for people to submit a response. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to end this poll, share these results. Awesome. All right. Looks like optimism in the lead. Always love to see that, but we see some feelings of surviving and anxiety as well. I'm very confident some of our conversation today may help with those feelings. I'm going to stop sharing this poll and launch that second poll. What is keeping you up at night? Finance, sales, marketing, scale, pivot team, or surviving? And this one just tells us a little bit more about your current needs as an entrepreneur so we can make sure we are providing relevant and meaningful programs and resources to all of you. Awesome. We got folks from Chicago, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, New York City, Florida, Michigan, Florida, Virginia, Buffalo, New York, Charlotte, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, Monterey, California, Trinidad and Tobago, Lagos, Nigeria, San Diego, Georgia. Welcome, welcome. So great to have you all dialing in here with us today. Awesome. I'm going to end this poll and share these results. Finance coming up in the lead, fitting for our conversation today. Sales coming up behind, but we got needs all across the board here. So thank you all for participating. Super helpful. Going to stop sharing this poll. And without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our two uh, first special guests, Paloma Vision, lead for commercial women's business development strategy at BMO and Titi Ikile, Chief Program Officer at Working Solutions, CDFI. Paloma, welcome back. Titi, welcome back. So great to have you here, and I'm going to pass it right over. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. So good day and happy Women's History Month again to all of you who've joined us. Uh, this is actually our second session delving into the world of community development financial institutions, more commonly referred to by the acronym CDFI. CDFIs are financial institutions that provide credit and financial services to underserved markets and populations. And today we're obviously going to be talking about that specifically to how they support both early stage and small businesses. I think the biggest takeaways that you can expect from today are to learn what CDFIs are and how they support businesses in a variety of ways. But before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to properly introduce myself. 
My name is Paloma Vigen, and I am part of the BMO's commercial banking team. At BMO, our mission is to boldly grow the good in business and life. And I have the privilege to do that every day uh, by working on strategies and programs to support women business owners and leaders thrive. Additionally, I have the privilege to serve as board chair for Working Solutions CDFI, which is the first to believe in startup and early stage businesses by providing diverse entrepreneurs with affordable capital, customized business consulting and community connections to increase economic opportunity in Northern California. Um, so today is wonderful for me because I get to marry both my job and a passion by supporting CDFIs. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Working Solutions Chief Program Officer, Titi Akile, to go over an overview of CDFIs before we're joined by our panelists. So Titi, thank you. Thank you so much, for, uh, Paloma, for the introduction. And I'm quite delighted to join you all today. Uh, as Paloma mentioned, I will be sharing a quick high level about CDFI, how it functions, um, and then providing a specific example using working solutions as a sample of California CDFI of just what an experience with a CDFI could look like. So first of all, you know, as she had mentioned, co uh, community development financial institution is exactly what a CDFI stands for. So when you look at it first as a community, the mission is centered around vulnerable populations such as women, people of color, and low-income communities. And then the second part of as a financial institution is that uh, really make sure that the, the, the capital that is being provided is affordable and is accessible, uh, typically for uh, individuals and entrepreneurs that are not able to get it from mainstream banks. Um, and as CDFIs are not always equal, uh, some provide small businesses uh, capital, some provide housing capital for affordable housing, and some provide capital for community projects such as clinics. Um, and then um, one of the more recent needs that they've been really able to step into is really helping drive a re businesses, support businesses that to get out of high cost debt from predatory lenders. So how do they really function? How does a CDFI work? At the core of it, first is that they need capital. And so the capital sources are coming from um, banks, uh, sometimes from grants, sometimes from, sometimes in the form of loans, uh, low interest loans, sometimes from government um, um, sources. Um, from, from foundations, and this uh, becomes a bloodline of, of the capital that gets uh, deployed out and lent out to borrowers. And then as borrowers pay and re make the repayment, um, they are able to recycle those capital again and again over time, you know, and many CDFIs over years, you find small businesses coming back three, four or five times to uh, borrow um, and to, to get additional capital from the same CDFI. And again, with that comes the impact of having small businesses grow to having small businesses, you know, uh, more stabilized in low income communities. And so how does that really function? What are some examples? So, so working solutions as a California CDFI, how it functions typically is really prioritizing uh, five core communities. Uh, like I said, the low income communities, women entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs of color, um, early stage businesses, startups that are not able to in, go into a traditional bank and get capital. And so what are typical product offering, especially when you speak about a CDFI that is supporting small businesses? It's first the capital, providing small business loans at affordable rates. Um, and sometimes also in the case of Working Solutions provides micro loans, small business grants. Um, and then the consulting, pairing um, capital and consulting together. Um, we find that that is critical to the success of small businesses and especially businesses that are early stage startup or coming from low income, low -income communities uh, that have been you know, displaced in the past. Um, so we provide this consulting, both pre-loan technical support uh, to help the businesses get uh, the understanding of how to apply for a loan. And then after they get the capital, they also get free uh, customized consulting support uh, matched with their loan. And so what's an example of a loan product uh, using Working Solutions as a case study? The 5,000 provide 5,000 to $100,000 in terms of capital loans available. And they also can get up to three, five-year loan terms. 
nine to eleven interest rate. Um, and but one thing I want to really focus on is really the the eligibility that there's no minimum credit score, uh, no minimum on business revenue, so they can be at that startup pre-revenue stage and no collateral needed, no prepayment penalties um, needed, uh, but they would have a personal guarantee requirement. Most lenders do, do ask for that. And that just really means that as an individual, when you get the loan, you also are pledging uh, as, an, as the owner of the company to also repay in case the business, it doesn't survive. And so it's an example of just some of the great kind of, you know, feedback that we get from some of our, uh, from some of our clients. This is a client that, a local clients that makes this really great sauce. And um, and they really valued not just the capital, but the network and the connection. We find out a lot of women, business owners, low income and communities of color really appreciate that support, that peer-to-peer -peer connections that they get and the consultants that help them find opportunities uh, to grow their business. So really, again, um, what is some kind of highlight of how the consulting typically would work? In, in the case of working solutions, the focus is really on helping them focus on three core areas, building their money skills, um, how they manage the finances, and then also, also the management uh, of the business, the operations of the business, and then the marketing, um, which we find that uh, any business that's going to need to grow would need to know that there's a visibility, they have a plan on how they market the business. So these three core areas are what the consultants work for and focus on. They also provide resources such as, you know, online tools and one-on-one -on -one consulting and peer-to-peer -peer network. These are all different types of learning styles that uh, are available uh, to, the, to the small businesses as well. So what would it look like if a small business entrepreneur uh, today were to show up and using the gain working solutions as a case study, uh, they would typically would just could go online um, and complete a loan inquiry form. And that form would either tell them if they're eligible or not to proceed to get a full, full application. If they are eligible, typically they get that full application. Within 30 minutes, they complete that application. The application then, uh, it's now in a place where it would need to have some verifiable documents that would need to could be submitted. And those documents could be like your tax returns, some of the other, depending on the size of the business or the, the document or the requested amount, the document list could, could vary. Um, but those are also collected at that point uh, in step three. And then from there on that is reviewed uh, for a decision. All this could take between two to six weeks, depending on really the business, um, their their own availability of their questions around uh, the, the documents that they're submitting. And everything can be done in the, the digital space. Um, and you could pretty much be able to get the capital wired to your accounts within, you know, uh, once they approve us though, within about a week or so. So in, 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 in preparing for, uh, for uh, accessing capital, it's important to also be mindful of the documentations that would be necessary um, so that when you do apply, you will be able to have those things readily available to provide. And there are three core document types that are typically needed. One is the financial documents, the legal documents, and then the planning documents. And in these cases, um, these all have different, uh, they all have different use and, and reasons for it. For the financial documents, this is really helpful to understand how money comes in and out of the business and how the repayment will be structured and if this business can afford the capital. And then the legal documents really help us to understand who the owners, who has the rights to be able to make decisions about the business and who should be part of this, this, the decision-making process. Um, and then the planning documents really helps us to understand, you know, what are the business, you know, the big picture vision of the business, the plans, uh, the legal framing of like the lease structures and things that would help us understand how the business, you know, will will function in the um, uh, at the big uh, the big picture. And so, with that being said, um, you are probably coming from what I know, was noted. Many of you are coming from all over the country, and so uh, you might not all be in California. But the good news is that there are over thirteen hundred certified CDFIs in the United States. Um, and also in um, in the U.S. territories as well. And so there is a link here, and I'm sure we'll be able to provide that as well uh, for you in the chat. And there is a, a code that you can scan, a QR code you can scan as well to be able to search from your own region to see 
the, uh, the, the closest CDFI to you. And um, there is one in every state, but there are so many, again, 1,300 across the, the, the country. So this would be a great opportunity for you to kind of take that and scan through it and see. And so for working solutions, this is a bit of us. If you're local and you're California, you want to stay connected to us, I uh, would also love to do that and you know support you. Or if you just have general questions, just about just how, even if you're not local, you have questions, we could be a great resource to connect you to another CDFI. That could be a good fit for you. Again, thank you for the time. Thank you so much, TT. That was really helpful. Um, so now I'm excited uh, to be joined by some of our other panel members. Um, I'd like to welcome Ziamara Rosa Tedla, the founder of UNOETH, um, which I'll get her to explain a little bit more about, and my colleague, Ronald Millsap, who's the director of our US Zero Barriers to Business program at BMO. Welcome, Ziamara and Ron. Um, before we get into our discussion, I'd love to give you each a minute just to explain a little bit more about your background. And Ziamara, I'll start with you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Ziamara Rosa Tedla. I'm the co founder and owner of UNOETH. We are a handmade leather goods and home decor brand based in Oakland, California, also father daughter um, owned. Um, we we started on accident and it was so funny how we got started with a gift. My dad gave me a leather messenger bag after visiting family in Ethiopia. And I was working corporate at the time and everyone kept asking me about this bag. They wanted to know where it was from. They wanted to understand like where they could they buy it and everything like that. And I couldn't tell them where to get it. It was, a, it was handmade and it was from an artisan that my dad had met in Ethiopia. And my dad had told, uh, I told him what was going on and he's like, I think we should start a business. I was like, okay, I don't think that <laughs> I could do that while I'm working a full-time job and everything like that. And so people kept asking about this bag and they wanted to know where they could uh, get it from. And they asked if we can get a pre-order with this company that didn't exist. And I told my dad and he's like, okay, let's help our artisan partner launch his own business so he can connect and we can start this business. I was like, okay. So we had 15, 20 pre-orders of this amazing leather messenger bag. And my dad went back to Ethiopia with two empty suitcases and came back with them full of leather bags. <laughs> and we gave them to the people who had pre-ordered with us. And then soon we started to get uh, inquiries of from random people, emails. Like, hey, my friend Shannon bought this bag. Can where can I get this back? Can I pre-order? I was like, all right, fine. Let's do a photo shoot, set up an online website. And we officially launched in February, 2015. And that's the very beginning of it, but um, that's how we started. And that's kind of our background. And that was nine years ago. Okay, I guess I can get started. Um, <laughs> uh, Paloma, thank you again for the introduction. Um, before I say anything, I just got to tip my cap to the beautiful women here on this uh, panel conversation and webinar with us today. Uh, Zia Mara's story inspired me. I've had the pleasure of now partnering with TT uh, on a webinar where we where we did the first series of our CDFI conversation. And Paloma is just a fierce champion and ambassador for our women's segment at BMO. And I just appreciate her for inviting me to this conversation. Um, I'm a native Chicagoan. I'm born and raised. I'm a a father and a husband, 16 years of marriage on March 15th. I got a 13-year-old boy, eight-year-old daughter. And I found myself really working in community development banking um, for the vast majority of my career. I worked for a CDFI bank um, in Chicago. So I got exposure to the industry and understood, you know, the, the nuances between CDFI banks, loan funds, uh, you know, equity investment shops on the CDFI side. So just a just a broad exposure of the industry. And got the opportunity to come to BMO to lead our special purpose credit program. And I feel it's just a distinct honor and privilege um, to be able to lead uh, our U.S. segment and offering education, networking opportunities and capital access to underrepresented founders across our footprint. Uh, we're now in 24 states with our program. You can access it through our retail branch network across 22 states where we have a thousand retail branches. Um, just It's just been a tremendous program in three years we've done over 117 million in lending, supporting over 4,300 small businesses across our footprint. And it's stories like Zia Moros that really get me uh, excited about this work. 
So shout out to all my East Africans and West Africans that may have joined us for this call. And we look forward to uh, hopefully a very robust conversation. Back to you, Paloma. I think I Paloma might be frozen. Did you want to take over, TT? Yeah, I can. I can do. I can do that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, again, um, it's a it's a pleasure to join you all again. Myself and Ron were on uh, with Paloma last, um, I believe, a couple months ago, and um, part of this is this conversation is meant to be a continuation um, of it. And um, I, as I as I mentioned in the presentation, I am part of Working Solution, which is a local CDFI. Paloma happens to be also our board chair. Um, and so this conversation is really uh, centered around how can we just even bring up a voice of an entrepreneur and how um, her experience has been through just getting capital and how what she can kind of share uh, from that vantage point. But um, to kind of kick us off, I wanted to ask Ron, what other options do you think an entrepreneur has to be able to, you know, get capital um, to be able to fund their business um, what other options do you think are available out there? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll first, we first have to talk about you know the presentation that you led in terms of the CDFI ecosystem and the opportunity to uh, start with the CDFI ecosystem to start exploring early uh, opportunities for you know lending and or grant opportunities. Uh, also, like your local cities, counties, and states, uh, there's just been like an explosion of additional investment that came on through the pandemic. Um, both you know, large commitments that were made by financial institutions, as well as just intervention to understand that uh, women um, and other underrepresented businesses um, need more supports. So when we look at the, the small percentage of uh, business starts, I love that Zia Moore talked about she started the business accidentally. Um, and, and, and so that should demystify for a lot of people the fear of actually going into business. Um, and I've had great stories both close to home and in the work that I've done over my career, where when you start out, you start with the idea and you start with pressure testing that idea across various stakeholders. Even before you start thinking about capital, you try to build what I would call your natural network. And, 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 and just those, those folks who really will support you and believe in what you're bringing to bear in terms of the market. And, I, and, and if you don't come from a, an abundance of resources, a lot of folks are able to have friends and family start that initial round of investment. I'm not going to deter you from what I would say. You got to have a hustle mentality and, and really bootstrap sometimes to start off. That's not the conversation that people want to hear. But being in business requires a lot of sacrifice. It, it requires sometimes working a nine to five gig and then doing five to nine the business where you build up some resources to do a proof of concept. Um, if you start at the city of fire, start at the bank with just the business plan and you've not done additional work, it can be very hard actually access capital. So I don't want to tell you that there's a tremendous amount of grants out there and resources. Grants have their criteria as well. And they want to see some type of, um, you know, number of years in business or startup operations. So I think like the first things first, even before you go knock on doors, accessing capital, refine the business plan, test the product and invest in it yourself to show you have skin in the game. And then you have everything from venture capital to CDFIs to banks um, to grant opportunities and sources that are out there to help support your business. That's great. That's great. Yeah, like you said, it's it's so key to be the resourcefulness is is, is significant, um, and uh, it's a it's a great trait as an entrepreneur to, that entrepreneur needs to have. Um, uh, before I pass it to Paloma, I guess I'll I'll pass the question to Ziamara. Um, I think Ziamara, you've shared briefly earlier just about just how you started the business. Um, but maybe can you share just also about your funding journey and how, um, what, you know, kind of just a bit, give us a, some, paint a picture for us on your funding Absolutely. journey. Absolutely. And I, I want to echo what Ron was highlighting about having to work nine to five and then work, go home and work from five to nine or later than that. When I first started my business, I was working a full-time job and also a part-time styling gig on the side too. And for us, we really grew with a $1,500 that we had invested in inventory and then started to do pop-ups every other weekend um, just to grow our business and to understand like how, where this is going and just generate sales and really get that traction. Um, it wasn't until a year and a half into growing our brand that I actually went into full-time entrepreneurship. 
Um, and it's very important where you have to, like, where you start to grow and you start to show your sales receipts <laughs> and so that you can take that to um, a financial institution so you can prove like, hey, we actually have a business here. We have grown year over year and we've grown in these different ways from pop-ups to online to wholesale channels and whatever that may be. Um, our first way of getting of funding was through a crowdfund through Kiva, which we raised 10K through friends and family. And through that program, you actually pay that back to the people who invested in you. And after I did that, I actually did a business boot camp with a local entrepreneurship center here in Oakland, where they helped me develop a really strong business plan so that I could go to Working Solutions and say, hey, invest, like help me with, grow my business in getting funding. Like this is what we've done year to date. This is how we're growing. This is our plan to how we're going to actually grow, not just from a local brand here in the Bay Area, but to across the nation and globally. And that was our first journey into getting $40,000 in lending from Working Solutions, which catapulted us into a next level where we actually had to go back to Working Solutions. I'm like, hey, can we get some more um, funding so that we can keep growing? And it's not only that just in the money aspect, but it's just the, the resources that we, Working Solutions provided and also with advising as well, too, so that we can make sure that we have the same or we can have sound advice and feel secure in going where we're going with our business too. What an incredible journey, Ziamara. Um, and just really interesting to hear kind of that evolution of getting to a CDFI. Um, you know, Titi, you kind of went through the basics of applying for a loan, but, you know, what else would you say, what does an entrepreneur need? You know, maybe what is that ideal time to really start to look for a CDFI? And, you know, should they expect a experience similar to Ziamara kind of like starting in one phase uh, with a uh, crowd crowdfund sort of an opportunity or what do you expect to see? Yeah, thank you. So I would say I'll paint the picture in two, uh, two uh, sections. One is for the startups and one is for existing business. For a startup that's coming in, um, usually it's always good to just come in and just ask for conversation. Um, and you might not even know where to start. And one of the good, great things is that we have a great team, that we have a high touch um, in the digitized approach. And so there will be somebody to speak with you on the phone um, to help guide you and see if you're actually ready for the loan or if you should still or refer you out to a support network that could help you provide some more business planning, coaching, or some idea, ideation support uh, for you. Uh, but uh, the point where we feel like you're ready and that means you really know exactly how much you need, you have a business plan, uh, then we put you through the application process. But an existing business, it's, it's very similar to Zamara's experience. It's, you know, you could just be six months into the operations. We still encourage you to come in. Uh, the documentation requirements, could vary depending on how much you, you're you looking for, but don't let that stop you because I think coming in would give you at least an understanding of what is needed um, to then be able to make the right preparation and support. And then also getting you connected to the support network that will help you have a successful journey. Love that. Again, that support network seems to be hugely important. Um, but in any fundraising uh, scenario, it's really beneficial to have a business account with a bank. Uh, Ron, can you talk about why that's so important for uh, business owners? Yeah, I, I mean, we talk about this all the time and, it, it, you know, banks are commodities and it feels like everybody's trying to sell to you. Um, but at the end of the day, like when you go and sit down with an investor or you go and sit down um, with some a vendor or a supplier or some relationship that you're looking to develop, and they begin to ask for documentation, even when you think about, you know, applying for a grant, if you will, or a loan, um, to the extent that you have a bank relationship and a bank account, it just, it just, you know, it, it shows professionalism, number one. Um, you, you're a professional, you have good record keeping um, in terms of what's coming in, what's coming out. Um, banks provide so much ease and convenience today that you don't have to have a physical branch presence. You can do a lot of that banking digitally. You can connect your accounting softwares to your banking to really have real-time picture of how your company is performing um, is great for compliance but overall. Like I said, just when you think about um, some of those fundraising activities and, and different issues that may come up with managing different investor funds and things of that nature, you got to be able to show a good record for it and, and that you're retaining it and that you're using it as you outlined in your plan. Um, and once again, just adds to the overall credibility of your organization 
and transparency um, for your fundraising efforts and the partners that you have in the journey. Thank you, Ron. Um, Ziamara, what advice would you give to a new business and the value of relationship building with a financial institution? Have a plan. I think that's something that I didn't have when I first started out. Since we started on accident, we're kind of just willy nilling it. And um, I strongly advise on a business plan, but it's really important to have a good relationship with your lender or your banking institution because when you need it, when you need help or advice, like we're normal people, let's level with each other. And they will give you, they will steer you in the direction where you actually can get help from your institution, from your bank, and to really get to where you need to. If you have a huge purchase order that just came in, but you don't have the funds to supply it or get it crafted, or if you need a line of credit so they can keep operations going. There's so many different avenues of how you can get assistance for your business to survive. Closed mouths don't get fed. And if you don't open your mouth and let someone know like what you need and how they can help, and you'll be really surprised that a lot of people want to see you succeed and they want to see you help. So you can't do that unless you build that relationship and just be professional, be nice <laughs> and be sincere. Um, you know, that was really reminded me of too, and not that I want to go back too much to the pandemic, but, you know, one of the big comments we heard, especially from small businesses who maybe didn't have a banking relationship, they had such a hard time getting access to PPP funds because that was one of the requirements, right? So, um, again, not that we're going to go back there, but it's another way to think about having those established relationships really can be helpful for when you actually do need that help. It might not be all the time, but when something comes up, it's really important to have that relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. So I kind of want to go into a little bit of an example case study moment. Um, you know, the dream is for your business to start and then just grow. But one of the good challenges a business can face is unexpected growth. Um, TT and Ron, I want to start out with this example of, say we have a one-year-old business that maybe, let's say, for example, gets picked up on Oprah's favorite things list, which I think for any business owner would be the dream, right? And then all of a sudden they have someone like a Nordstrom knocking on their door saying, we want your product in our stores. This can be awesome, but they maybe don't have the ability to scale that quickly to help get into a, a, a size business like that. What would you suggest a business do and approach a situation like this, especially given how intensive and especially capital intensive fast growth can be to them? I can start, TT, and I would say, first and foremost, let's play this exercise out real time. Yeah. So if you're contemplating starting business or you're in your business journey, you've yet to hit that milestone moment where you get opportunity for scale and growth, what should you be doing? And Ziamora talked about the importance of a business plan. You know, you have to approach it very strategically and proactively, even before you get the growth opportunity. How your brand shows up in terms of making sure your, your brand and your image is very polished, making sure you have strong marketing materials, websites um, to kind of, you know, support things. And then even as you're building it up, your inventory or your product, you have that in your mind that one day this could really blow, right? So you may have the supplier that can get you 15 to 20 widgets. But then as you think about like who, you, who you're doing business with and what opportunities you're eventually going to scale to, it's never too early to start thinking about what is that next supplier or vendor relationship that I need to have? How did I get onto that next shelf of a major brand or, or retailer? And as you start to think about that, it creates an exercise whereby you start thinking about, okay, even if I got that, how can I potentially fund it? And where do I get the capital to get there? So running a sound, you know, strong strategy, sound business, profitable business, even at one year can present a compelling case where an investor would say, you know what, this has the ability to get gas and really scale in a way where as an, invest where as an investor, I can make that investment and clearly see my exit strategy out of the business. If you don't start with a sound foundation, i.e. that business plan and those strategies that you're doing to kind of create that strong brand impression and connect with the audience that you're trying to reach out to, you're kind of handicapping that ability if it ever presented itself. We do things in BMO like we present spotlight opportunities with some of our sponsorships and relationships across the bank. And when we have lent to customers, we consider them part of our, our, our you know, zero barriers to business program. They're 
They're, they're folks that we want to continue to grow and build with and take them to the next levels of, of banking with us. But we start to look for what are, what are people saying online about the business? We go to look to the website to see that the website is in good shape and it represents the brand well. Um, all those things become a part of decision making, even for banks, as we think about who we're going to give that opportunity to, um, to be able to be on an Oprah's list, if you will. So you start this work very intentionally from the very beginning of your business. And you hear people say, and it's kind of cliche, start with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. So start with the big vision and start with the end in mind. And remember, as much as you work in your business, you have to constantly be working on your business or you'll miss the opportunities for true scale. That's such, such a great uh, feedback. Um, so I think Ron addressed the proactive entrepreneurs. I'm going to ad address the reactive entrepreneur who mm -hmm. don't have a plan and just had just got a call like we need 100 pallets of whatever that product is. And you're like, whoa, excited and scared to death. And so I, I would sell stuff to that person and say, because we've had a couple of this conversation with some of our clients, is really kind of take a step back and see even like this opportunity is great. Um, look at the numbers, have somebody else kind of take a deep dive into the numbers. And I'll share some organizations that could be really a great support. Uh, every, every county and every city, not every city, but every state usually would have a small business development center. They are, those are free resources that you can have somebody else sit with you and look at the numbers. And also then ask for a timeline, ask for, okay, great. What's the timeline on this, Roger? When is, when is a turnaround? So you can buy yourself time to negotiate. Don't always take what is given to you at the front face value because there's always room for negotiation. But sometimes because businesses are ex excited, they're scared, they think that this is the only first time it's gonna come. Somebody's knocking at your door. That means you have something great they want. And that means there's room for you to actually push back and ask for some terms. And sometimes the devil is in the details. So if you know that you need capital um, and you know the cape, what are the options that are available? Typically, when it's a new, if it's a startup capital, you can get term loans from like a bay, from a from a CDFI. But sometimes you might need a line of credit that you need ongoing capital, and you might need to have those terms negotiated where they can say, oh, instead of sixty days, can we get to push it down to fifteen to 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 thirty days? Those are the negotiation skills that will be helpful for you to also build in and having somebody else like an advisor on your side that can help walk you through those. Um, and then also looking at the details of the margins and the profitability of this, of the terms that has been offered to you. Is this really gonna make sense? And there's some deals that you might have to walk away from because at the end of the day, it's, it's all glamorous, but you're gonna be losing way more money from walking into Costco. I'm not, I'm just saying, naming Costco as an example. I'm not saying Costco is gonna lose you money, but that could be an example of it. That, you might need to step back from it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, TT. But I do also love that you, both you and Ron gave the examples of proactive and reactive responses to a situation like this. So that was really good to talk about it in a hypothetical sense. But, you know, ZMR, I'd love to talk through, you know, how you had to approach um, these relationships as you've, you've had some larger vendor sort of supply relationships and have you had to say no or kind of like take a pause to think through these? I will say that it's very exciting to receive a huge inquiry and request for hundreds of thousands of units of your brand. That's awesome. Um, for me, since I partner with small businesses and artisans in Ethiopia, all of our leathers from Ethiopia, all of our materials are from there. Everything's handcrafted there. So for me, I have to really be honest and upfront with the purchaser and say, hey, I can't supply this in this amount of time, but I can in this amount of time or break it down into different chunks. If it's if it's say like a thousand and break it up into thirds or whatever it may be, um, that's really important, especially with all the hiccups that we had during the pandemic about supply chain issues and inflation and everything like that. It's very important to be upfront and honest. Um, in addition, Sometimes the deal isn't going to be great for you because you're not going to make any money off of it. And for me, what's most important is to support my artists and partners. And if they're not getting their return on investment for their work, their their hard work, and and neither am I, then I don't think that this is a good business um, business deal. So I, I have had to say no before, unfortunately, because of in terms of pricing. 
um, and couldn't get down to the cost that we wanted to. But also in terms of supply, when I was upfront and honest and say, hey, that I could do it in a certain amount of time, then it was it was they were way more easy to work with me because they understood my mission as a business owner and also um, <laughs> let's make this deal actually work. Yeah, no, I think this is super powerful. And I hope that, you know, I, I've actually had this happen with, you know, an entrepreneur we, we know, and, you know, again, this is a big one that we specifically see, uh, with, uh, business owners that are, you know, have a made good. So great one to pay attention to. And so I, I love that we got to go through a hypothetical and a real life example. So thank you. Um, so, you know, TT, one of the big questions is, you know, do CDFI stay with the business for their entire life cycle or, you know, is there kind of a transition as a business scales uh, that you help them get ready to tra transition to a traditional banking relationship? And, you know, after TT gives that response to Yamar, I'd like to kind of talk about your experience as well. Yes, uh, we uh, we pretty much uh, encourage a business to move into traditional opportunities um, when they, we see that they're ready for it. Uh, but we also find that we, uh, even when they do do that, they still lean on us for advice and support. Uh, the cases like the business has been around for 20 years, has a strong relationship with their bank and reached out to say, I'm looking at buying property. Uh, how do I think about that? You know, what are some thoughts you have around that? And just giving them some recommendation and advice. So they, because there's a trusted relationship, they always lean back and seeing what are, what is our thoughts and sounding board, um, it's always a great place. So, so yes, um, we, we, we keep them for relationship connection, but we also connect them outside. Love it. And, and Ziamar, again, what was your experience like? Uh, I have had the pleasure and honor of working with TT since year, just under year two. Um, so seven years we've been working together and it's, um, obviously, I'm out of the zero to five year bracket that CDFIs usually um, assist in for lending to small businesses, but I've definitely utilized the resources and as a business advising. And I think it's really important to keep that network large and to be in constant contact in some way, form, or fashion. Because while I've after working with Working Solutions for two rounds of funding, I also got another funding through another CDFI for a much larger amount. And I needed to lean on my <laughs> TT to vouch for me for um, just as a referral. And I think that's really important to, for someone to have. Um, and, I, and I don't think that, I don't think it should have to end at some time. I think it's really important to keep that going. And if I can also help in any way with uh, Working Solutions or any of my other partners, I'm happy to do that as well. Yeah, that that connection and still being part of the network. And again, you're a great case study in success, right? So if you can give back to that next startup entrepreneur who sees what you've done, I think that that's hugely impactful as well. Um, so Ron, as we talk about that transition, what should a business owner be ready to expect when they come to a bank? I got to preface this and I, there's another kind of acronym. I know everybody's heard all, all the time and I got to come up with my own. But we talk about having a bail team, right? Uh, a banker, an accountant, an insurance agent and a lawyer, right? So you want to have that bail team even before you approach um, for lending need, right? So as, as you think about just the basics of having a checking account, you don't stop at just running the rails of the digital process. You want to know the bankers at the institution that's you know most proximate to you and know the the branch manager and then know like the structure of the bank in terms of uh depending on the level of borrowing are you assigned a relationship manager or a person that, that's going to be dedicated to working with you and then as you get into that process of inquiring about the lending every bank has an application process right so you're going to go through their application process and complete all the information that they will want to have, balance sheets, income statements, cash flow statements, um, you know, business plans that you have uh, in terms of preparing your kind of, uh, you know, pitch deck or, or book that you're going to be able to go sit down with the bank and talk about your business. You want to think about your own personal credit assessment. How am I doing uh, from a business credit perspective? Because that's that's important as well. And also, what's the, the health check or the litmus test on my personal credit? And if you know that there's challenges there, document the mitigating circumstances while also taking the necessary steps to work on credit repair. 
A lot of folks out there that offer credit repair services and they charge you a fee. I'll be the first to attest you don't need to pay a fee to repair your credit. There are a number of free resources out there. Most of your banking institutions now give you access to real-time simulations on things that you can do in your personal credit to improve your personal credit. Understand the environment in which you're borrowing. What are the interest rates? What are the terms? Like, how is that going to affect my cash flow of my existing business? And am I fit to actually take on debt at this time? A lot of banks require collateral. There's some lending that goes up to a certain dollar threshold um, where you don't have to provide accounts receivable or collateral. You want to know what those options are and how to access those. Um, oftentimes, it's going to require a stronger guarantor situation, maybe stronger cash flow to support that. But there are lending options where you may not have to pledge collateral. So do your homework, do your research. Um, when you think about replacement, you know, there was an old school tradition in banking. You often knew your banker. You lived in the community. You didn't want to you know, default on the debt, so to speak, because there's a reputational risk that you would have in doing so. I think as we've seen more easy money come into the economy, we've seen a lot of bad habits around debt repayment and owning obligations. Um, take on the debt responsibly, own the obligation through and through. Treat your bank like a partner. And when you have issues, come in and talk about those because we can work on remediation plans together in terms of getting you back on the right trajectory. And obviously there's risk management things to consider and other legal and regulatory uh, things to consider as it relates to your particular business and or industry. But always you know, do everything you can to prepare even before you sit at that desk because that's going to ensure that you have the most successful outcome. Thank you, Ron. And I love the throwback to the bail team. Uh, Got to give Flossie Hall uh, credit for that acronym, but it's a great one. Um, before we transition over to live Q&A, um, Ziamar, I just wanted to finish off with, you know, what are those key two to three lessons you really learned around accessing capital and managing unplanned capital needs over the years? Mm -hmm. It's just so funny that Ron was talking about easy, a lot of more easy capital being accessible now. And um, not all money is good money. You got to look at how, what is the cost? How, what is the repayment on this? What, what are you paying? If you're paying $5,000 on just 10,000 that you're accessing, like that's, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you have to look at the fine print and you really need to, like realize and actualize what are your actual needs and don't take out more than you actually need. And what can you actually repay? Like, like, let's be honest, like put down everything that you expect to pay every month. Um, and what is your current cash flow? And do you have anything in the reserves? Like, do you have anything to save yourself if something goes wrong? Because, and I'm speaking of this because I experienced a huge inventory loss that got lost, um, burned in a fire, $126,000 value of inventory. So I had to scramble and I had to like really access those kinds of different um, financing and um, be, be, be wary, <laughs> be wary, I would say. Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, those are all great comments. Um, so thank you again. We are going to continue to hear from our panelists, but I do want to transition to some of our live Q&A questions. Um, TT, I think these first two are for you. Um, first off, and I, we actually heard this our last time around, um, can a CDFI benefit someone who is a non-U.S. resident? They don't have a social security number, but they are a registered U.S. business with an ITIN and a U.S. business credit card. Can a CDFI still help them? Absolutely. Um, many CDFIs do offer what they call IT loans. Working Solutions is one of them. And so, yes, there, there is um, a resource for that. Great. That and, and Ron, on the banking side, is that something we can still assist with as well? Uh, yes. We actually, through our Zero Bears the Business Program, we support I-10 uh, customers. Um, so we, we have a digital application process in our branches. Um, but for I-10, we would take a paper app since they don't have a traditional social security number. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, another question for you, TT. Um, are CDFI capital loans um, through the SBA or are they through that CDFI directly? Uh, it functions a bit kind of uniquely. So SBA, when you think about SBA, SBA can be connected to, it's an outside agency, a federal government agency that could be connected to a bank, it could be connected to a CDFI. So there are some CDFIs that do offer SBN loans. Uh, so when you're asking, you can kind of you can ask them and say, is this an SBN loan? 
um, sometimes it's visible from externally, sometimes it's not visible, it's kind of on the back end. Uh, but that's that will be a specific question that you can ask the CEO. Great. Great. Um, I think they meant to say our CDFI loans, but are CDFI loans non-dilutive? Um, we don't go into um, like, you know, equity at all. And so completely based on repayment and personal guarantee doesn't touch it. Great, great. Um, I think this question is a great one for all of you to probably add in um, what you think, but do you know of any free resources to help with bookkeeping and tax filing? Um, I need support with these things before I think of a lender that will invest in my business. And I, I think all of you probably have different resources you'd love to reference. I can drop my contacts and they can reach out uh, depending on where they're located. Uh, there could be different options that could be offered to them. So I'll drop my Great. Generally speaking, I would say that if you're a nonprofit, um, there are accounting softwares and solutions that um, they may have packages and discounts as a nonprofit. Generally speaking, for a for profit business, it's, it's typically going to be hard to actually ac access um, bookkeeping or accountant prepare services for free. Um, you, you know, these are things that you have to build into a normal, normal course of your business. I will say that uh, next week on the 26th, we partner with Arena, which is a contract CFO, and we're giving out uh, three months of uh, services. So you get a, a free license for up to three months to be able to uh, pilot accounting services and, and begin to work with your business. So that's, that's one potential resource. You can join the NASDAQ Center next week and, and automatically registering qualifies you for an opportunity to get those three months of services to start. Thanks, Ron. And Ziamaro, maybe what are some of the resources you've leveraged? Um, my my mother is also a, um, an entrepreneur, but she referred uh, her bookkeeper to me. So I personally do not do my bookkeeping service. I tried QuickBooks one time and apparently I was doing it all wrong. So I went with a professional um, and it's, she's not free, but uh, we have, if you can get get creative. You can offer barter services too. Like I also do marketing and online services and whatever. So we kind of did that trade as well. Yeah, that, sorry. That was just a really good uh, reference point for me too. I, it's okay to not be perfect and, and great at doing everything to run your business. So to your part, Ziamara, if you're really good at the marketing piece and you don't need to outsource that, at least until you get to a very large size, keep doing it. But if bookkeeping and all of that is not your strong point, you are going to save yourself time and money by hiring someone, right? Like there's, there's no so question. So much that. time. I have wasted so much time and I've actually created more work for my bookkeeper. So just don't outsource as much as you can, because then you get to focus more time on your business and growing your business and getting out of inside your business where you just kind of get trapped and overwhelmed with all the day to day. Yeah, no, um, I think you, that triggered me because that's one of those things that's just like, <laughs> one to remember if it's not in your wheelhouse it's okay um there are great things oh. out there. <laughs> um ron this is a great one for you um in this digital age most of us not most a lot of us have opened online business accounts um that does obviously limit the opportunity to build a relationship with your bank um is it best to open an account with a bank you know in person or, or what should they do in that instance like how do they actually get that engagement I, I leverage LinkedIn quite a bit uh, professionally. It's the only social media that I that I actually consume in terms of like having a profile out there. And I love it when I could take a digital or uh, online um, conversation and connect it to a personal real world experience. So while we're always going to be constantly innovating around technology and the use of technology, i.e. how much we're using these platforms post kind of COVID and pandemic, um, but I would say to you as much as possible, it doesn't necessarily require that you have to undo the current bank that you're working with. Now, if it's purely an online and digital bank, I think having a wallet share could be a great concept where you start to align some of your banking based on your values. Um, maybe it's a local credit union or community bank um, as you think about the size of your business and the services that they provide. Uh, maybe it's a super national uh, or, or, or regional bank uh, that you wanna connect with, but as much as you can fuse, um, that that human aspect into it and be intentional around it. It could be that you just reach out every quarter or every every you know or biannually. But you they know you, 
you know them you're able to share updates and insights around your business they're able to share updates and insights around theirs and you prep that relationship even before you ever have a need so there's no excuse for not making it human interaction when you can thank you ron uh, well, this has been wonderful, but I'd love to have all the panelists leave with one final gem, golden nugget of information. Um, Ron, I'd love to start with you on that. So I kind of seen the news yesterday uh, with Mackenzie Scott and essentially doubling her uh, committed uh, investments into philanthropy um, and supporting a lot of organizations across the U.S. And it harkened me back to 2020 when I've seen her also make significant investments into the CDFI industry. Um, as I think about folks who are on this call who may not have any awareness about CDFIs before, banks and CDFIs can work in, in perfect harmony. Titi talked about it earlier. The idea that you start from bootstrapping to getting a CDFI loan to then getting referred to a BMO, for example, is a natural pathway of growth and it's what we expect. Um, we directly invest in organizations like Working Solutions in terms of equity investments and debt investments. We also support through, through our philanthropic means and, and grants and different um, programs that they operate. And I'm proud to say through our Zero Barriers to Business program, we've looked out and our best partners across our footprint are CFIs because they provide a tertiary source of capital, um, be it term debt or working capital loan. So, our no's could be a not right now, and we can refer you to a trusted partner that can help you and get you back on the road to recovery so that you're more fit to be able to fit into the box of traditional lending. So if you if you take nothing else away, CDFIs are immensely important to the overall financial ecosystem. Support them as much as you can, because without them, there will be even more gaps as we think about funding for women and other underrepresented business founders. Thank you, Ron. TT, what is your final final remark for us? Yeah, I, I would just say it's a call to action for everyone um, that uh, from everywhere, from wherever your seat is, there's something we can do. Uh, just with, you know, this discouraging clawbacks on DEI initiatives, um, it's important that um, women, um, women of color, um, everyone kind of stands up and really reaches to help somebody else and reaches forward to get help. Um, and that means it's all together, it, meaning you find find a resource, find a network of other women that are doing great things and plug it into that and ask for help. Um, and because it's information that's, it's those informal knowledge base that could really make a difference in this time to have support. And then also find somebody else that's struggling that you can be a, like an insight to, to be on, to just be online where you're just providing some good feedback to encourage that person for resources. I think that's the way we're gonna make it through this together. Thank you so much, TT and Ziamara. I th I think one of the biggest things that has been super beneficial in my entrepreneurial journey is that is to create a community. And as an entrepreneur, it could be very, very lonely. You could be a solo entrepreneur, maybe it's just you and a couple other people, but you really have to build that community so that you can access resources. So you just tap into that. I know sometimes it can be really scary to network and maybe you're an introvert and you don't want to go through X, Y, and Z, but everything that I have built from now is because it was a referral from somebody else. I would have known about CDFIs if it wasn't for business entrepreneur uh, bootcamp in Oakland, California. So I think it's really important to share knowledge. I share knowledge with all of my entrepreneurs every single day, whether it's at a certain event or a certain grant to apply for, or for a business accelerator, um, anything like that. I think that it's really important to share that knowledge, to build that and just be able to lean on each other. I think that especially during times that we've been the past four years as an entrepreneur has been fun. <laughs> so I think that I think that's really important to really build that community. And every day I talk about how working solutions and Pacific Community Ventures has been really pivotal in my growth and accessing six figures worth of funding. Yeah. Well, and congratulations again on that. I think that's just a huge milestone that you should be really proud of. Um, but thank you again to all of our panelists today. This has been a joy. I always love to get to talk about CDFIs and especially to celebrate someone's success. So thank you, all of you. And Michelle, we'll turn it back to you.
Awesome. Paloma, Ron, TT, Ziamara, what an incredible conversation for Women's History Month. Thank you all so much for coming together. Um, and on behalf of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, we're just so thankful you all joined us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. And to our audience, we'd love for you to join us again for upcoming webinars, which you can view using those links that are going to be posted in the chat. And thank you all so much for joining us today. We look forward to welcoming you back online with us soon.